Dropout is a regularization technique used for neural networks. The idea is we don't want to have a network that is very dependent. So one layer is very dependent on features from a previous layer. We want it to be resilient in the case of missing features. So let's say, for example, we have a neural network which has learned some various things, right? So we've got our input coming in here. And let's say we are learning to detect cats. And this has, the neural network has learned to make this neuron, this node, identify whiskers. And then this is, let's say, some sort of a cat detector. The cat detector turns out to be very reliant on whiskers or not. So the cat detector uses weights that are very low for here and here. So these are close to zero. And this is a high value. So pretty much the cat is entirely dependent, the cat node is entirely dependent on the value of the whisker node. The problem is that is reliance means we don't generalize very well. So it may be that all of our training instances, cat has, cats had whiskers, okay? But what if we come across in the future a picture of a cat that doesn't have whiskers? Well, it would be good if it were also learning to use other features uh, that might be useful. For instance, uh, the fluffy feature. Or there might be another feature having to do with maybe it's not a picture, maybe it's a movie, and so there's something about purrs, right? So the idea is that we are going to selectively provide amnesia in our neural network as we're training. That is, for a particular batch, we may say, hey, guess what? You have to learn how to do your job of, let's say, identifying cats, but I don't give you any whiskers. This node is going to just return zero. And so you have to learn whether this is a cat or not based on just whatever your remaining nodes are. Okay? And that's going to cause it to better, uh, to be a, a stronger node and better able to determine because it's not going to be so reliant on the features that have, that have, that have been so helpful in the past. Instead, it's going to have to look at finer grained information. So that is kind of the idea of dropout, really. Let's just call it selective random amnesia. We also, you know, learn about the fact if you, uh, for instance, become blind, you're going to be more reliant on your hearing and you're going to be better able to hear things and get information from your surroundings. So that's the same idea in that we will just block out certain nodes during training. So we have layer K in our network. And we have layer, what well, used to be K plus one, we're gonna now call it K plus two. And we are gonna add in a layer K plus one, which is our dropout layer. We've got some nodes here. Let's say this is of size four. We don't know what size this is. Could be three, for example. Without dropout, this would just be an identity layer. Layer, So we would go straight across. And then from here, we would do our standard fully connected. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to add in a little switch here. And this switch can be on or off. And what we're going to do then is, for every batch, with probability p for each node, set the output zero. That is, and p, you know, might be let's say 0.1, maybe all the way up to 0.5, something like that. So we would say, okay, probability, well, let's say it's 0.1. Uh, we set this to zero. Oh, 
we are going to set this to zero. We open the switch and this doesn't go through. So we're going to get zero out, zero out, zero out, zero out. These, we probability 0.1, we, we flip our dice or flip our 10-sided die, and these all come up, no, leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. So only this one happens to be turned off. So what will happen then is we will go ahead and do our forward pass. We will do our backward pass. So in the forward pass, all of these inputs to the next layer from here are going to be zero. So there is going to be no component from this node into anything in later layers. Similarly, when we're coming back and doing our backpropagation, the gradient is all going to stop here. It's not going to go any farther um, because this is going to cause a gradient of zero. So for each batch, we do this. What this is really doing, in some sense, is saying every single batch has its own network. Right? The network from batch to batch to batch changes slightly, depending, of course, on how many dropout layers we have, how high this number is, uh, this probability p. But we get these different trained networks, and we can treat it sort of as if we have an ensemble of all of these slightly reduced power networks. And then what we do is put them all together in one big network at the end. So this is training time. At inference time, so that would be when we are checking the validation data set or the test data set or we're out in the field just doing inference. But at inference time, we don't drop out. So it's as if we've taken all of these separate, somewhat diminished models and created this uh, super model that contains all of these diminished models as sort of subsets of it. So we don't do any dropout. There is one thing that we need to do, and that's it. That's the basic idea of dropout. We just say the network is going to have to learn to generalize and be more resilient in the face of failure. So rather than being reliant on any particular feature from one layer to the next layer, it's going to instead learn to be resilient and learn to try and extract as much information it can out of all the features because of the fact that they, they might not be there. The only thing we really need to take care of is the fact that at inference time, we have a difference from training time. So at training time, our inputs into one of these nodes at the next layer are going to, on average, the input is going to be lower than it would otherwise be because with probability p, we cut off some of the inputs, set some of them to be zero. So to account for that, so when we go ahead and turn off dropout, then these values are going to be higher than they would otherwise be, because all of a sudden we're getting uh, non-zero for every one of the inputs from the previous layer. So what we need to do, is, so these will be getting larger values than they were accustomed to during training. So we need to arrange, arrange to fix that. So there are two ways to do that. We need to basically scale. One thing we can do, so let's say we have a dropout rate of, let's just make it extreme. So let's say, say p equals 0.9. So that would say 90% of these are going to get reduced. And let's just imagine we have a large number here. So that means that we'd get one-tenth of our values here than we would get if they were, there were no dropout. At inference time, these values are going to be 10 times higher than they were at training time. So therefore, we need to reduce outputs by a factor of 10. So that is, we're going to just go ahead and multiply output by 1 minus p. In this case, it would be multiplied by 1 tenth. So the dropout has basically a flag in it that tells are we at training time, or are we at inference time. If we're at training time, independently for each of the nodes in this layer, apply the probability of p and decide whether it's going to be 0 or not. 
And then at inference time, we go ahead and just multiply the outputs by 1 minus p. We can either do this, or we can do the scaling at training time. That is, what we can say is, well, we know that we're reducing the outputs at training time, and so at inference time they would be larger. So why don't we just go ahead and scale now to make it larger, to match what would happen at inference time. So, or what we can do is multiply by, well in this case if p were 0.9 we'd want to make it 10 times bigger. So we're going to multiply by 1 over 1 minus p. Don't do both. Choose either this or do this. And your implementation of dropout will probably have one or the other. One of the advantages of doing it at training time is that you can actually just totally remove this layer then at inference time. So because it's really going to be a no-op, it's just an identity that passes through. So you could just drop the dropout layer, so to speak, drop out the dropout layer uh, at inference time. Another advantage of doing it at training time is that allows you to change the dropout rate over time. Right? If you are doing your scaling at inference time, you have a single value of p that you have to use. So you're assuming there was a single value that was used for training. But maybe you want to adjust the dropout rate over time. So for 10 epochs, you want to have a p of 0.5, and then you want to drop it down to a p of 0.4, and then drop it down to a p of 0.3. Well, all you really need to do then is scale by 1 over 1 minus 0.5 for those first 10 epochs, and then 1 over 1 minus 0.4 for the next epochs, and so on. That really can't be done easily at inference time. So more flexibility if you do your scaling at training time. So that is dropout. The concept of dropout can be used in a variety of different ways. So you can actually look, for instance, at dropping out input. You can look at dropping out not entire nodes, but just single weights, if you want, is another possibility. But this dropout layer is very commonly used in neural networks and provides a very nice regularization approach. Just as a reminder, what's P here? Yet another hyperparameter.